Now I'm a guest teacher. I'm not, I'm not here all the time, but I'm just so grateful to be here and continuing on in our series with Jesus. Who is he? As we go through the book of Matthew, and we'll be adding another descriptor about who Jesus is to our Lord. Today we'll be covering Matthew 12, 1 through 14. And before I go, you know how sometimes a pastor will go, hey, I'm, this is going to be a short one, I'm real quick, and it goes on forever. <laughs> you ever heard that? Yeah. This isn't going to be a quick one. Um, <laughs> so just before we get into it, we're going to let you know, we're going to be sitting down for a while, get comfy. Uh, I hope this can enrich your life and we can, we can dive in and, and reflect on ourselves and reflect on who God is. Because that's what this is about, knowing more about God. So let's read Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Take this first chunk of the passage. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scripture what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only priests were allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And normally, I like to just go first by first reading, but we have some foundations to lay first. So first off, can anyone name the Ten Commandments? Any of the young people? Let's see, anyone know? Or any? Oh, yeah, you. Really? Thou shalt not murder. Uh, not commit adultery. Okay. Respect your mother and father. Right. Uh, thank you. Do not steal. Do not steal. That's a good one. You got the rest. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's on for you. We're given the Ten Commandments, and these Ten Commandments generally summarize the other 600 and something commands that God gives us in the Scriptures. And these commands are God-breathed. They are never changing, because our God doesn't change. And that's such a good thing, that God doesn't change, because it's how we know that He will always keep His promises. He's kept them in the past, and He will continue to do so in the future. And we believe that God calls us not to murder, lie, steal, commit adultery, or covet, and we, we Christians, we don't set idols in our homes and we keep ourselves from misusing the Lord's name. We honor our parents even well into our adulthood for it's a good and right thing to do. But there's one command, and I'm grateful that you brought it up and you said the command, right? That we all agree is good. But I think the church as a whole has found ourselves forgetting. I've seen people say that God has changed his mind in disregard of this command of his. And some of the ancient church said that following this one of the Ten Commandments will push you off from Christ. Pretty crazy. I've seen pastors and people alike saying that this command is Jewish and only for them. But the wise who read their Bible will understand that if a command comes from God to his people, it's not Jewish, it's Godish. Godish. Right? It seems to me the command that many, if not most, Christians have forgotten today out of the Ten Commandments, is the only one that almost prophetically starts by telling us to remember it. Do you know the command I'm talking about? On the Sabbath, right? Thank you. So church, I know a while ago, I, I was confused. Don't you ever feel confused about the Sabbath sometimes? You ever feel like you have to shy away from it? I've seen church, churches teach on the Ten Commandments and, they, and some of them skim over this one. And some people might wonder what to do. Who's the Sabbath for? Does it matter to God or to us? Why is it even in the Ten Commandments? And I asked all those questions, and sometimes I still do, and there's variations. Most of my life I was told that the Sabbath was done away with. But when I read the Bible, I can't find that. I could find Jesus and his disciples honoring the Sabbath, but I could find nowhere that they disavowed it. So we're going to talk about the Sabbath before we get into the passage today. The word Sabbath, or Shabbat, comes from a word meaning to cease, desist, or rest. Exodus 20, 8-11, gives us the command of the Sabbath. It says, remember to observe the Sabbath day 
by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. And that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in, in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. And so first, we've got to figure out what does it mean to be holy? Right? To be holy is to be set apart as sacred and consecrated or dedicated. So an illustration for this is I, I used to be a volunteer youth group leader and I had a student who every mission trip and, and, and church camp we went on, he would bring a five-pound bag of sour patch kids. <laughs> This is obviously a nightmare because anyone, any kid who brings a five pound bag of sour patch kids anywhere, definitely doesn't need a five pound bag of sour patch kids. <laughs> and this student would be, you know, obviously it's five pounds. He would share it over the course of the weekend or the week. And uh, he had one condition though you couldn't eat the blue ones. So we don't have a handful, we have to throw the blue ones back in the bag because uh, that was his favorite. And so when we got to the end of the bag, and it was just blue ones, we got to enjoy, you know, all of us would share just the blue ones. I'm sure there were fewer, but they were special and set apart for this guy. And this is obviously a crude way of understanding holiness and consecration, but it might be helpful to understand that the Sabbath is kind of like a blue sour patch in the God. It is set apart, and it is special. It's holy. And we need to remember that the Sabbath is holy. And we need to keep it holy because God made it holy. He shows us a little bit about what it means to be holy in this. He shows us what it means to be blue solid patch set apart from everything else. Because that's what you and I are, Christian. We are set apart as holy when we believe in Christ. We, Christians, are set apart people. We honor our holy God by remembering and resting on his set apart way. We're called to rest on the seventh day which, stay with me, we would call it Saturday. Saturday is the seventh day of our week. But that day has never changed in history. And we're all, we ought to do this because we don't want to rest in just any old way. We want to rest the way and the day that God rested. We take this opportunity every week to recall that God created everything. And that's why the day is set apart. And there are a few ways we are told to observe the Sabbath, this holy in this verse from Exodus. And the main one, the main first one's being, don't work. Don't make others work. Don't make your animals work. I like that he has a covenant with the animals. You know, you guys don't have to work either today. You will trust in God for your provision and rest on the seventh day, which is God's Sabbath. And we see that the Sabbath goes back further than Mount Sinai, where the command was given. It goes back before the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath was given in creation. In fact, it was the cherry on top when God created the seventh day of our week. And just as God rested, he tells us to rest, which points us to this thought that the Sabbath is made for us. If we weren't here, if humankind wasn't on this planet, the Sabbath would not be remembered. You see, the sun, moon, and stars, they all have, they all have their purpose in keeping time. You know, a day is dictated by the sun, um, a month is dictated by you know, the moon cycle. And a year is dictated by the constellations and are revolving around the sun. But the Sabbath is different because you can't find it in nature or the heaven and luminaries. The seven-day week is created by God for us as a kindness. And it's so important for us to understand this today, that the seventh-day Sabbath is for you. It's not a burden. For didn't Jesus just say in our passage last week, my yoke is easy and my burden is light? It's important to understand that the Sabbath is intended for you, because let's be honest, some of us are where we're always going to work ourselves to death without a day off. And maybe God's trying to get through to you, but you've busied yourself so much with the world that you don't have the time to hear from him. And I'm the guilty of this too. We work for like the man all week. And this day is set apart from all others is to remind us that we are not slaves to this world. It's an appointment to meet with the God of the universe, enter into his throne room, and rest in him. And it's a chance to tell God that you trust him more than your employers. The Sabbath forces you to trust in God. 
It forces your dependence. In Genesis, or Exodus 16, God provided manna for the people every day. He told them not to take more than they needed each day. Reminiscent of how we pray for our daily bread, right? And when they, of course, were disobedient, and on Monday they took extra manna into the house, because they didn't know if they would get more tomorrow, it stung. It rotted. It was a horrible smell in our house. Probably stayed there for days. And then on the sixth day, right, they learned their lesson after five days of, I should not eat more of this in my house than I need. On the sixth day, Moses told the people to gather and keep extra manna. For the next day would be a day of rest dedicated to the Lord. And behold, the manna kept overnight into the seventh day. It didn't stink. It was good. So God rested here by not dropping manna, and we rested by not collecting it. The Sabbath gives us an opportunity to thank the Lord for giving us situations that we can trust in Him more. Because it brings about a dependence on Him and His Word. It's important to understand the Sabbath because it's important to God. See, each command in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, each command in this gives us insight into who God is and what he likes and what he dislikes. Each command draws us closer to him, not for our salvation, mind you. Your salvation can only be found in the blood of Jesus. But this draws us in for relationship. Not remembering the Sabbath is like saying, I don't need to understand that aspect. And if we break one law, it's as if we break the whole thing. Uh, family, I know, I know this is a lot. Some of you might think that I'm saying that. Hey, you're sinning by not keeping the Sabbath. I, I promise I'm not. But the Bible is. They say that to me too. But I don't do this, I'm in sin. It's not coming from me because I fought this a lot too at first. I didn't want to do it. I like making extra money on Saturdays. But God loves us, and he wants us to obey this. And it might take a learning curve to get to a point of obedience, but if you're pursuing Christ, you're going to be pursuing obedience to him and his word. So I promise we're going to get to the passage soon, but I think this is important, and if we don't understand the blessing of the Sabbath and the actual regulations upon it, of course, the rabbinical Jews back then, the Pharisees, had so many regulations on the Sabbath that God didn't. This passage is going to be lost on us if we don't understand. And I know many of us have grown up in a church that, 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 that may have taught you that the Sabbath is done away with. I don't talk about anything else saying done away with, by the way. Get rid of my plate. I'm done. Do, do away with my plate. This is a weird phrase. I used to think this way, too, because I was taught that. But when I read for myself and stopped lying on our traditions, I found that it was anything but done away with. You remember in Matthew 5, Jesus says prophetically, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Heaven and earth have passed away yet. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So before we get into the text, I don't want us to be distracted with, with a couple of simple objections in our head that we might have. Because like I said, I fought this for years. I know some of the objections that I would have. If I heard some crazy looking guy up here saying this stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to go over a few common objections so that we can focus just on the text when we get to it. So common objection number one. Jesus is my Sabbath rest. I love that statement. It's so lovely. And I love that we can rest in Jesus' finished work on the cross and cease from our own work because of him. But we have to ask, does this mean that the Sabbath ceases? If we take this line of reasoning to other statements, such as Jesus is the bread of life, Jesus is the living water, Jesus is the door, Jesus is the light of the world, we get beautiful and profound statements that do not mean that we stop eating bread, drinking water, having doors, or using the light of the sun, right? In the same way that these remain, to point us to Christ and remind us of him, so does the Sabbath. Number two, I take my Sabbath on this day. To this objection, I have to ask, whose Sabbath is it? It's made for us. Well, who does the Sabbath belong to? And does man have the authority to set something apart as holy, such as the day of the Sabbath? 
I don't want to dare contradict God. It says in many places that the Sabbath is is not ours. So remember, this this isn't my opinion. This is God's word. I'm reading. Exodus 31 and a few others. Uh, Leviticus 19, Ezekiel 20. Exodus 31 specifically, it says it's his. It says, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Because God cares about this so much. In Numbers 15, a man was executed for picking up sticks to light a fire on the Sabbath. And his excuse wasn't, I take my Sabbath on Thursdays. Fortunately, we won't be executed for working on the Sabbath anymore. But it does show us how much God cares about his Sabbath. It tells us that it is a sin and grieves God's heart when we set it aside. And if it grieves God, shouldn't it grieve us? We, Christians, we don't have a set apart holy day of our own making, in our own time, in our own way that God does. In fact, we see in Daniel 7.25, for any prophecy buffs out there, we see that the enemy seeks to wear out the saints and thinks to change God's times and change God's laws. So we need to be kept far away from this line of thinking. I'd like to know church. We're all here on a Sunday, right? Remembering the Sabbath and going to church are two different things. My family's practice, usually every week we go to church on Saturdays and we have a potluck and dinner together, and it's a huge blessing. I also love coming to Promise Church on Sundays and worshiping with everyone, and as a bonus, you know, me and my friends, we get to go out to eat, and we don't got to clean up afterwards, and that's a huge blessing, too. We can't do that on the Sabbath because that'd be making someone work. There's no problem with what day we go to church. The only problem is when we don't rest and remember what and when God said, said to. If you have questions about this, because it might be a little confusing, we can talk afterwards. Objection number three. The Sabbath was Jewish and only given to Jews. And I will say it for as long as the Christian church takes to get this. If God commanded it, it is not simply Jewish. It is Godish. That's right. Thank you, family. The Sabbath isn't Jewish. It was given well before the Jewish and Gentile distinction even was made before Abraham, who was the father of the Hebrews, was even conceived. It was set apart in creation in that first week. And the last one before we get to the text. We are not under the law. We are under grace. It's another verse that I love, and I think we sorely misunderstand sometimes. When we use that to promote lawlessness, if we take this verse out of context and nullify God's Sabbath, we can logically use this verse to allow divorce, fornication, murder, stealing, and I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And it doesn't work that way. We need to view this phrase in its proper context. We get this phrase from Romans 6, which I'm using it in ASB because it does it a little more literally. It says, For sin shall not be a master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. See, sin is defined as transgression of the law. And it will not be your master, Christian. When we are under grace with Jesus as our good master, we are no longer mastered by sin. See, the law has a bite. It's a snake. It has a bite in some ways, but without consequences. See, it has no venom for us when we're under Christ, when we're not under sin. We can have laws that say, you may not do this, but if we have no consequences against them, the law is rendered ineffective, right? You know, you can say, do not kill, but if there's no punishment, someone can go kill you. There's no, there's no problem with it. The law cannot bite us anymore when we are under Paul foresaw this as being misconstrued, which is why the next verse he says, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Grace is not a reason to sin, family. It is the God given ability to get up after we sin. For when sin has the ability to condemn, when its bite has venom, there's no reason to stand back up and try and live up. There. But when sin has lost its sting, which we call death, we can get right up and continue pursuing righteousness in God through Christ. I promise, I know this sounds like a sales pitch on the Sabbath. It's almost done. But I just want to drive this home or waste the point of the text. The reason we went through all this late work is because the passage speaks not of should I keep the Sabbath, but how should I keep the Sabbath. So to recap, Sabbath, the fourth of the Ten Commandments, is the seventh day of the week that we call Saturday. It is a day for the Lord that he calls us Christians to rest on and remember his creation. We are not to work or make others work. That's pretty much it. Pretty simple. Sounds nice. And now that we are all Sabbatarians, or people who follow the Sabbath, from this day forward, we're going to begin our text. We're going to start in verse 1. 
It says, uh, at that, about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they started breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. Jesus and his disciples are walking through the grain fields, and we find out in verse 9 that they're on their way to the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath. We see that the disciples are hungry and eating some grains in the field. Israel was commanded in the Torah, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, to not reap the edges of their fields, so that the poor and the, and the traveler might eat of them as they pass by. So if anyone thought, hey, why are these guys stealing from these farmers? They're not. It's just a great provision for the needy. And in verse 2, uh, but some Pharisees saw them do it and protested. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. They're attempting to trap Jesus, and they'll continue to foolishly do this. They accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath law. They wanted a reason to discredit Jesus and his followers. They probably saw that awesome sermon, and he's gaining some, you know, gaining some followers. They don't like that. They're jealous. They said it wasn't lawful to pick and eat something as you walked on the Sabbath. But what does the main Sabbath command actually say? <coughs> Remember, we read this in Exodus 20. You have six days each week for ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. So, family, does the Sabbath, or, 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 uh, sorry, does grabbing a snack seem like working to you? No. I see a bunch of your No. They're working about as much as microwave and a burrito is working, right? Where did the Pharisees get this idea that, that, is to, that to pick a grain of, uh, uh, grain of wheat on the Sabbath? And it comes from the same place that so many things Jewish and Gentile like come from. Tradition. <laughs> My grandma used to sing that. Who's seen Fiddler? Such a fun movie. The Pharisees and many Jews operated within the belief that God gave his written law, that we have here, the first five books of the Bible, and then he, in addition, gave the oral law. Someone call it a halakha, if you ever hear that word. It's, it's traditions that are passed down from their elders. The Pharisees and many rabbinic Orthodox Jews today would have earnestly believed that these laws and rulings were on par with God's word. But Jesus didn't. They believed a whole mess of things to be work that Jesus did not. And we're going to have a list up here. I'm not going to read it because it's just wild. Look at that. That we read one verse about what not to do and what to do on the Sabbath. This is just a portion of some Jewish writings on a few sentences later after this, it says, if one reaps, grinds, or etc., one is liable to bring a sin offering. So they viewed any of these things as sin. While we can glean some good ideas on what working is from this, or how to better enjoy the Sabbath, maybe, from writings like this, we don't find absolute truth here, family. Only man's interpretations, extensions, or elaborations on truth. And in their view, they thought Jesus' disciples were sinning, and that Jesus was condoning their sin. In their eyes, Jesus was only man, but a mere sinner. Next we get to Matthew, uh, verses 3 and 4, where Jesus begins to answer their accusation with scripture. He brings up a story where David ate the bread of the presence in 1 Samuel. I'm going to read that passage that Jesus is quoting from. 1 Samuel 21. David went to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he saw him. Why are you alone, he said. Why is no one with you? King sent me on a private matter, David said. He told me not to tell anyone why I am here. I have told my men where to meet me later. Now, what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread and anything else you have. We don't have any regular bread, the priest replied. But there is the holy bread, which you can have if your young men have not slept with any women recently. Don't worry, David replied. I never allow my men to be with women when we are on a campaign. And since they stay me even on ordinary trips, how much more on this one? Since there was no food available, the priest gave him the holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle. It had just been replaced that day with fresh bread. God's law says in Leviticus 24 that the bread of the presence, it was arranged before the Lord every week and replaced every Sabbath. These loaves were holy. These loaves were the blue star ranch. It's the God. God and his portion were the priest's inheritance. When the bread was done being used for the ritual, it went to the priest where they had to consume it in a holy Sabbath. And this is so important for understanding the story. The priests worked in the temple, often in shifts for stretches of time, so they couldn't always attend their own flocks or fields or businesses. Yet God made sure that they would be fed with his portion. 
These 12 special loaves were set apart as the bread of the presence, and David asked for five, leaving plenty for the priest. The priest would be provided for. So why did Jesus bring the story up? Some of you may come and pass it behind it. Jesus' disciples were hungry, and David and his men were hungry. How cool is that? And in each of these stories, the men would appear to be breaking the law, and God would say the contrary. The law is good, and it should be followed always, but it is the precept or the general, oftentimes nuanced rule, more than the written code in some ways. For God's law, when it is viewed as rigid and stiff, would have far less bearing and much less conviction and power in our lives. We need to view the letter of God's laws as bearing weight with its precepts, that value would protect you in life. The strictest view of the law is occasionally wrong, and the loosest view of the law is occasionally wrong. Clarify the strictest view isn't always wrong. We would all agree, do not murder, right? Thankfully, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm the bad jobs. <laughs> the strictest view is often right, but it does not always cover the entire precept of which the law intends. And it's not because the law is bad, but because our understanding is faulty. Praise God for Jesus' explanations and for a spirit to guide us. For example, the precept of the we can say we do not murder, but if we hate someone in our heart, it's like we committed murder, we sin. And we can say that we do not commit adultery, but if we lust after someone, we sin in our heart. And we can say, for a newer law, the speed limit is 25 here, but if a kid's crossing the street, you don't stop because the speed limit is 25. You sin, right? There's the precept of the law. Jesus recognized his and David's men's hunger and gave them a means to eat. In so Matthew 12, 5, we have another rebuttal to a rigid interpretation of the law. A, a, a rigid interpretation will say, priests do the work of sacrifice, organizing, teaching, interceding, and many other things on the Sabbath. Therefore, they must be profaning the Sabbath. And yet, God holds them blameless. We know that the priest's work has to value and protect him, interceding for Israel and for people, so that they can be close to God. Preserving and bringing people close to God is the opposite of profaning the Sabbath. And we'll see later that it's actually a holding set. Does this mean that all men are free to work all days? No. Yeah, the disciples had baskets in their hands and picked grain, and some local farmers failed to bring to market the next day. I think this would have been a completely different conversation. It's a simple statement that the law of Moses is not as rigid as the Pharisees would believe it to be or would want it to be. Mercy and service to God are always in love. Matthew 12, 6 has some strong language to a religious Jew. It says, I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. The temple is more than just a building. It is the center of their religion and their nation. If we recall in 1 Kings 8, when Solomon finished building the temple and brought the ark into it, the glory of God filled the whole house as a smoke. They all had to get out because it was too much. The temple is where man would encounter God. The temple is where man would go to be made right with God and where he would, he would worship and where the presence of God dwelt. And for Jesus to claim that he is greater than the temple is to claim that he is all these things and more. For now that the temple is destroyed, we go to Jesus to encounter God, to be made right with God, and to worship God. For Jesus himself is God in the flesh. Jesus is certainly greater than the temple in all its glory, for the temple could not contain all Jesus is priesthood, sacrifice, the offerings, the cleansing water, the blood, the cornerstone of the temple, the building of the temple, the law, and the head of every faithful person who enters that temple. Jesus is so much greater than the temple. Jesus is the glory of God wrapped in flesh. And God never even required a temple of stone. That was just for the people. God just required the people's hearts. And in Matthew 12, 7, we see Jesus quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. He says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. It says that the Pharisees don't understand this. This is not to say that God does not require sacrifice, interesting enough. Because God does require sacrifice. But it's only because we sin. 
If we were people who showed love and knew God, we wouldn't need the sacrifice. If we extended love and mercy to our neighbors, which is righteousness, we wouldn't need the blood of an offering. The Pharisees should have understood, but they didn't. They were blind guides to the people. They would condemn an innocent man for breaking the Sabbath because they lacked mercy for travelers on a journey. And David is called a man after God's own heart. And I believe it's because mercy is one of God's favorite qualities. It's the quality that he shows all of us a lot, especially me. David showed mercy over and over to King Saul because he couldn't bring himself to kill a man who was anointed by God. Church, do we extend mercy to our friends and our spouses? Do we extend mercy to our enemies? Moving on. Verse 8, it's incredible. It probably shocked the disciples and the Pharisees alike. The implication of this phrase, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath, it's huge. We're going to focus on three points. Look, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to add that to our graphic today. Lord of the Sabbath. This means that he is ruler and that he has set long ago its rules and regulations. If Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, said they did no wrong, the disciples did no wrong. Not only is he the ruler of the Sabbath, this shows that Jesus created the Sabbath. Not only is he a ruler of the Sabbath, oh, it shows that he created the Sabbath. All things that were made were made through him, including the Sabbath. And if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, this is my point number two, if Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, it is something that I want to be a part of. The Sabbath was created in the first week of creation. It was commanded at Sinai and is confirmed here by Christ. We should rightly enjoy the things that Jesus is Lord of. Last point on this is Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and this means that the whole day is about him. It's his day. Good things from God are the spiritual realities of and the Sabbath is no different. It reflects our need to rest from our work and in his finished works. If Jesus came to fulfill the law, and he is Lord of the Sabbath, we must try our best to enter that rest on Saturdays, lest we obey God from all the way, like the people of Israel. We should be careful to protect our time on the Sabbath and consider how we spend it. Now I want to flip to a companion verse of this, of this verse of Matthew. It's in Mark 2, verses 27 and 28, where, where Mark writes a little more of what Jesus said. It says, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I use NASB again because it's a little more literal. Sabbath is for man, not man for Sabbath. And I bring this passage up because I sorely believe that many teachers have misapplied this verse. We've used it to say that God made it for me, and that means I can do with it as I please. That's like a weird take. It's a sad take, in my opinion. We take something that is holy, that God has set apart, that God made for us, and we stick our noses up at it because some men who died a long time ago made the tradition that it's Judaizing and we would be cut off from Christ if we did. Married men in the room, think back to when you proposed to your wife. You bought her a lovely wing that you had ring that you had saved for, and she loved it when it was presented to her. She agreed to marry you, and you were both thrilled and in love. And in the years after, two got married, you begin to notice that it has a lot of things on it. You know, maybe some of the gemstones are missing from it, a lot of scuffs. And she tells you that she stuck it in the garbage disposal. And you go, what? How did that happen? Expecting a story of some accident, she's crying and wants you to fix it, you know. And she says, I just don't like it. <laughs> right? How about if she wore that ring? on dates with other men. Right? All right, how about this one? How about one day you returned home from work and you saw on her hand not the precious gemstone that signified your intent to marry her and love her for your whole lives, but a ring pop. Hold that up. Yeah. See, a ring pop on her hand. And when you asked what happened, she said she pawned her precious ring, took the cash at the candy store, and spent every cent on a ring pop. And when you asked her why on earth she would do such a thing, she says, it's not in fashion anymore. Besides, I was hungry. I wasn't 
made for the ring. The ring was made for me, right? In the story, is the wife using the gift correctly? No. It was made for her, sure. It was far less used. Men helped have a state in which you need to find this out. Do I have traded this precious ring a sign of your love? For nothing. Women, would you ever do this, dear man? But this is what we have done on the Sabbath in many regards. God's command to remember and keep the Sabbath holy was set apart. They're set aside because it was deemed by mere men unnecessary for us. The Sabbath is a beautiful gift God gave to us that we have been using incorrectly. Instead of enjoying God on this day, forsaking buying and selling, speaking His word and doing His pleasure, we have turned into a day of farm work business. In this way, God intended, is this the way that God intended us to use this gift? has it always been and always will be an appointed time to meet with God, which is a blessing to us that he wants to meet with us. I don't worship a God who changes. So we don't make the rules for the Sabbath because we're not the Lord's of it, Jesus is. We're really the recipients of this wonderful gift of rest and delight in the Lord. And remember, the point of this passage is not should it be kept, but how should it be kept. We'll see more of that as we move on. In uh, verses 9 and 10, we see that Jesus, uh, and, and what I would guess would be the same Pharisees he was walking with, uh, are entering the same synagogue. The Pharisees were ticked off at Jesus. They wanted to provoke a response so that they could trap him. They said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They had their answer in mind. They knew that their commentaries or their traditions said that you could heal something life-threatening. That was his but if it wasn't life-threatening, it wasn't acceptable to them. And uh, in another uh, commentary, Mishnah Shabbat 14, it says, One may not set a broken bone on the Sabbath, and if someone's hand or foot is dislocated, he may not even pour cold water on it. If that seems harsh, it's because it is harsh. Their idea of God's Sabbath was that if someone was in pain, they needed to suck it up and wait till the next day so they could be restored. And you know my phrase I like, uh, if God commanded it's not Jewish, it's Godish? This is one of those times where it's rabbinically Jewish, right? It's not Godish, it's Jewish. For our God is not this way. Our God hears our cries day in, day out, even on the day of rest. And he doesn't require us to be in needless pain. He's the good physician after all. Jesus' response is so wonderful in the following verses. He continues on the topic of mercy and kindness. Right? He says, uh, Of as well. If you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. How much more valuable are we, we than a sheep? His eyes on the sparrow, and how much more valuable are we than many sparrows? And so mercy on an image bearer of God is, of course, allowed on the Sabbath. When it says it is lawful to do good, and I know you know this, church. You know it's lawful to do good. But we also know it's not about any general feeling of goodness. Because remember, we don't set the rules. We're not the Lord of the Sabbath. The lawful good Jesus is speaking of is not taking your kids to a Cubs game or going shopping for groceries for the week. The lawful good is not going to work to provide for your family. For God gave Israel a double portion of man the day before the Sabbath to remind you that he can't provide for your family. The lawful good is mercy. And if you are in the medical field and you see someone harmed on the Sabbath, it is, of course, lawful to help them out. And if you are a plumber like myself and someone near you is that their house is flooding on the Sabbath, of course, help them stop their house from flooding. Right? Now, let's say that uh, someone wants a bathroom remodel on the Sabbath. <laughs> That's a different, uh, different situation. I don't know if that would be extending mercy. I think it would be enabling faithlessness. We are not led by our own fanciful ideas of good. We are led by God's word. And his word demands mercy for the fatherless, the widow, the poor, and the needy. And so what does Jesus do in verse 13? He sees this man with the, with the withered hand. He said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored just like the other one. He extends the mercy. Jesus restored this man to completeness, doing good. That was probably the best Sabbath this man had ever enjoyed finally receiving a rest from his ailment. For as creation was completed with the dawn of the Sabbath, so was this man. Do we 
end this text on an ominous note that, we'll, that we will encounter again and again throughout this book. The Pharisees, upstaged and upset, conspire against God himself. They wanted to crush him. Why? Because they had their, that he had challenged their traditions and their authority. They valued themselves, their status, and adherence to strict traditions above God's love of mercy in the man Jesus Christ. Do we sometimes do this? Do we value what we deem as godly above what God says is godly? We know that false believers have they've crept into a lot of churches with false doctrines. They say, homosexuality is blessed by God. David was gay. Have you ever seen that one? It's a weird one. <laughs> it's a lot of lives for gay. Abortion is, uh, is mercy on a mother. Never mind the child that's killed in the process. You can divorce your wife if you like. Sure, have an affair. We can vote for whoever we want because God's standards of electing a leader doesn't reach us for some reason. God doesn't care about the only one of the Ten Commandments that he told us to remember. We need to pull our Bibles out more family because there's some insidious traditions and twistings that have happened. Many have accepted, accepted the traditions of man as if they were from above, but I don't see a single thing in this passage or any other that tells man to ditch the Sabbath. It's God's commanded gift for us, and we should hold to it because it's a shadow of Christ. If you live in Christ's shadow, you are indeed going to be walking close to him. I'm not so ignorant as to think that I'm won you all over to the idea of the Sabbath or giving you a full understanding in such a short time. You may have some objections, and I'd love to talk about them afterwards. But as I run out of time, I'd like to give some final thoughts and encouragement. First, this is a reminder, I'm not saying it's wrong to worship on Sundays, okay? It's not. I think it'd be wrong not to worship Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all throughout the week. Sunday is as fine a day as any to worship. And it's incredible that Promise Church is being used to worship, edify, equip, and train the saints every day of the week in this building. We have to celebrate that where we meet isn't sitting empty all the time. That's a great thing. God uses this place incredibly. And it's not wrong to gather Saturday or Sunday. The only distinction is that there is a commanded day of rest in the Lord that takes place on Saturdays. It is wrong or sinful not to obey the commands of God. This isn't me talking. This is scripture. It's to encourage us to follow more closely in our master's shadow. We need to repent of the sin of omitting God's special blue solid patch day from our lives. This closeness starts with repenting. You can't get in a fight with your wife and expect to be close until there's reconciliation through repentance, right? To be closer to God, we have to repent of our wrongdoing. Second, the Sabbath is about trusting and enjoying God. Israel trusted God would feed them on the seventh day by giving a double portion on the sixth. We are allowed to and commanded to rest from all work on Saturdays. Enjoy it. Protect it. Nehemiah defended it with a sword. There are few, if any, more noble things than following the Lord your God. But remember, as the opportunities present itself, do good. Good. Come up here, help someone else, help your neighbor. Good. It would be wild if all the Christians honored the Sabbath and we rested on the seventh day, not patronizing any business, just enjoying the work. The world would feel our faith. Christians were doing this. St. Charles would feel the weight and the absence of God's people. They would feel a lack of God. Sometimes that's what you need in order to find God, to see how bad it is without him. They would feel a lack of God, but we're enjoying it. And it would probably stir some people to jealousy. And frankly, if the Christians were enjoying the Sabbath better than the Jews, it would stir them to jealousy as well. To be transparent, I don't have all the answers, all the exact motions on what to do and how to do it every Sabbath. A lot of families I know, they add traditions that help them honor the Lord, because not all traditions are bad. Many are good, just as long as they don't contradict God. We hold the basics right now, and we'll keep probably growing as time goes on in my family. We all figure out what we want to do. And if I, I believe if we had 100 people walking in this together, I'm sure we'd come up with some really fun, cool traditions that would help us honor God better and observe the day better. I know that when my wife and I started keeping the Sabbath, we had a business, and it was open on Saturdays. But we wanted to be faithful, and so uh, we stopped 
taking new clients on Saturdays, even when I meant losing business. And we knew that God would provide, and He did. It took a while for us to phase it out completely, but we did. So we wanted to be faithful. I, I promise you, it'll change your world. It'll teach you how to rest in God. It'll teach you to trust in Him more. There was more peace in our house in a lot of ways, and it brought us an intimacy with God. And third, I'd like to go back to the point again that Sabbath is not a Jewish thing. Sabbath is all about having a time appointed by God to delight in Him. How disappointed would your dad be if you said, I have a standing appointment this day every week to meet with you and you never show up because work or shopping or fun was more important. So now we're going to close with a few verses. We're going to read from Isaiah 58 and then Isaiah 56. 58 reads, Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day. But enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath and everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight, will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. I want to be caught not, caught not speaking well of that day, honoring God and celebrating Him. I want to delight in your heart. Who would be for God to honor you? The promise of God is that we celebrated today. And we can say this was written to Jews because this was. Well, let's look two chapters earlier. Isaiah 56 says, Blessed are all those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days of rest keep, and keep from doing wrong. Don't let foreigners, that's us, that's Gentiles, who commit themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will never let me be part of his people. And don't let the eunuchs say, I am a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters to give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. It will, I will also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest, and who hold fast to my covenant. This is talking about you, my friends. Jesus has taken the opportunity to invite you into something wonderful, an appointed time of rest to be close to him. There are no prerequisites to coming before Jesus other than faith. Faith that what you do isn't good enough, but that what Jesus has done on the cross and to the grave is good enough. And just like true Israel of old had faith that God would provide means of survival in the desert when man was dropped on the sixth day, the seventh, we too trust, our, trust on our sixth day that he has made a way for us, not just for survival with bread, but for eternal salvation by the bread of life in Jesus so that Sunday we may also rest on that day. So we see the board with all these wonderful, true things about Jesus and red hair. We have Lord of the Sabbath. That's the one from today. He creates the Sabbath. He has power and authority over it, and it points to him. Sabbath is all about him, and we can rest because he rested. And he didn't just give us rest in our body. He gave us rest for our soul. In the same way that the Sabbath requires faith, knowing God will provide for us, the rest in Jesus Christ requires faith. That he will provide a resurrection in the end. So here's today's takeaways. I'm almost done. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. We rest in him spiritually and the way he tells us to physically. Additionally, we must do good on the Sabbath when the opportunity arises. So we will open, now we can to open his word, get to know him for ourselves, not relying on tradition but on his words. If you don't know him today, I urge you to get to know him. It's worth it. There is rest in him. It is so worth it. So if you are tired, if you feel weighted, you are in the right place. We know the God of rest. We know a God who, who took a nap on a boat to storm. We know Jesus, and we would love to share him.